honor you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the power of your word, the truth of your word, that we can rely on it, that we can stand firmly in it and plant our feet and who your word says you are and what it says about us dwelling in you. We bless your name today. We ask that you would have not on only your way, Lord God, but that you would speak to us in a way that we know how to flow in you and in your purpose for this hour. We bless your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, I was reading the daily scriptures um, that Dwayne sends out, and I have read this scripture and heard this scripture my entire life. Every once in a while, when you're reading, the pastor says, we can pray, Lord, speak to me, Lord, speak to me, Lord, speak to me. And he's probably saying, get in my word, get in my word, get in my word, so I can. Um, and he speaks in a way that sometimes something we've read and heard for a really long time will just pop out. And it's Matthew 5, 14 through 16. I'm reading out of the King James Version. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not to glorify us, but to reflect and glorify him. Amen. And, and in the, Dwayne always puts um, a little piece at the bottom that helps you understand what that scripture is saying. That's so valuable. And um, that part of was, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we reflect it. Therefore, we need to make sure that nothing comes between us and his light. As I was reading that, I take a picture of things when the Lord pops something out, so I take a picture. Most of my pictures in my phone are not actually photos <laughs> of people. They're of quotes or scriptures or lesson ideas. or, um, And so I was going back through, um, because sometimes I'll think that's what the Lord's going to want to visit about. As Randy always says, let's visit about this. Um, I'll think that's what it is, but then by the time Sunday comes, he has flipped the script. And so that's why I take the pictures, because he may want to use it later. Um, but I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know, when we allow things to get in the way, we will no longer be reflecting him. And it will feel like sometimes we can try to reflect him in and of ourselves while we're not allowing ourselves or not making sure that we're being exposed to him. And it feels like work. I need to have a good attitude. I need to be kind to my coworker. I need, and it's like, man, this is really a battle. And I was just thinking about this, and I thought, Lord, it's so true. How have we started our day when we feel like that? Have we started our day exposing ourselves to the one and only? It makes a difference. It makes a difference how we start out. It makes a difference how we continue. It makes a huge difference. Sometimes we have to take, sometimes I just have to take a break and talk to the Lord. Even if I've started my day that way. I was like, okay, Lord, I need you to recenter me. I need you to shine on me right now. I need you to shine in me and from me because I'm having a little trouble doing it in my own strength. And I don't want to do it in that because it's not as good. Amen? When we try to do it on our own, it doesn't quite hit the mark. We need him. If we have ever needed him, 
we need him because the pressure out there, we were talking about it during our prayer time. We really made it worship time. Um, that in the spiritual climate we are in, that the world is in, there is a heaviness that comes. Even if you don't have one thing going wrong in your life, there is a spiritual heaviness because... He told us about this. It would flip. And what is wrong would be made right and normal. And so we're feeling that. Um, and we have got to stay in a place with him that is constant. Doesn't mean like we're walking around with our Bibles in our face all day long. But there is a place in him, that secret place where... We can hear him in an instant. That takes making, that takes working on a relationship. Tim and I were very close when we got married. But we still had to work, that thing that you come to where you kind of know what each other's thinking and you can kind of read a face and you can kind of know when your spouse is in a situation and they need you to come to their aid and they're not speaking a word but you know you need to go to where they are. And you, even if you're just standing next to them, be that support. That's how we work on our relationship with the Lord, so that we can hear him, we can feel him, we can know when he's nudging us in a certain way. We are to let our light shine. It's going to feel like work if we're not keeping our eyes on him if we're not staying in tune with him. You can't reflect what you're not exposed to. And I will say this as a person who has grown up and been in the church since I was 18 months old. That endeavor never fades. You can't rely on relationship from last year. Your relationship has got to be fresh. It's got to be new. If I relied on what my experiences were and my wins and my losses and the hard stuff that Pastor and I have been through in marriage from last year, we would be hurting in this year. In our relationships with him and with one another, we have to be active participants. Because we change. We grow and we change. So your spouse is going to change. And if you're staying in tune, you can celebrate that growth and keep moving along and understanding with one another. See, that was extra. That's not in my notes. Um, reflection comes from exposure. So I'm going to give you the stuff that seems hard, and then I'll, I'll give you the stuff that might seem not as hard later. <laughs> I thought, you know, there really are questions that we can ask ourselves um, that will keep us focused on reflecting him and exposing ourselves to him and all that he is, staying in tune with him, making sure we're spending time with him. It's easy to get off track, isn't it? it? It's easy. It's not right, but it's easy. And I know that he understands that. But just because he understands something doesn't mean that he approves of something. He was tempted just like we are. He endured ridicule, just like we do. But he left the example of not opening his mouth. That's hard. But we can do it because he gave us the example. Takes a lot of work. Here are questions that we should ask ourselves often. Am I still falling in love with Jesus? I know, it's sobering. 
am I still falling in love with him? Because there's a lot to fall in love with. But we can get distracted. Our eyes can wander. And we've said this before. It's been a constant warning from him to keep our eyes on him. Not to look to the left or right, but to keep our eyes on him. And so we know this. But we can get distracted. Am I still falling in love with him? There will always be something to fall in love with about him. He's so faithful. He's kind. He's powerful. He understands. He comes to us in different ways because we're individuals. That's beautiful because he really could treat us like a corporate being. Well, this is just what you do, so you all do it, and it doesn't matter where you're at and what's going on with you, just do it. Because he's God Almighty. But that's not the way he approaches. He's interested in us as individuals, and he's interested in relationship. So he comes to us differently. And it's always beautiful for me to hear how God comes to this one and that one and that one and to hear those stories because it's different for everyone. But you can still, I can still fall in love with him over hearing your story because it's beautiful and it's powerful and it shows his nature. Thank you, Jesus. This one came across <laughs> and kind of smacked me in the face, just being honest. Has my level of devotion grown in the time that I've known Jesus? Do I spend more time with him or less time? The person that was saying it, I think it was on the radio, was saying, when you come to the Lord... You take small bites of things because that's what you can digest. That's what you can understand. That should grow. I said, are you still reading the five minutes that you read when you first came to him? If so, it's time to look at that. And I thought, Lord, I have been exposed to you since I was 18 months old. I want to look at my levels of devotion. Do you still, and really this should be, maybe they'll watch the tape. This is for our whole congregation. Do you still attend the house of God like you did when you first came to the Lord? When there was nothing cooler and nothing more excited than Jesus and what he was doing in your life? Are you still placing yourselves in places of exposure with him and with the body. There's something about being with the body. And I think that's why he said, as the day approaches, even the more. There's strength. There's strength and be there's so much. There's just so much. That's a whole nother lesson. Is he Lord? Sounds like he's Lord out there. This was another one. Is he Lord? Telling God no is an oxymoron, which is a figure of speech that combines words with opposing meanings. If I can tell him no, then he is not Lord of my life. If I can tell him no, which he gives us the opportunity, he gives us free will. If we can tell him no, then he is not Lord. If we're saying no, not that. Everything but that's off limits. Then he's not Lord. Not that he's not Lord, but we are not proclaiming him and making him Lord. He's not sitting in that place in our lives and our hearts. If we can say, yeah, I know I'm supposed to do that, but no. I'm going to do this first. And then if I get around to that, he has to be Lord. And then we get upset when 
his plan is stated and we start following his plan and then we start following our plan and then we're like, Lord, why is, what's going on? Well, remember I said, I've done this. I'm just being transparent. And I realized along the way, my eyes got off what he said. And well, surely, do you ever have your kid go, well, uh, well, and you know that they're not telling you the truth. Well, uh, when you said that, I thought you meant, um, well, I didn't know you meant. I'm like, your face is telling me you did know. So let's go back to plan A. And let me speak very clearly. <laughs> this is what I mean. Um, and God, in his grace and mercy, will take us and say, okay, let's try this again. This is what I need you to do. This is how I need you to do it. This is what I don't want you entertaining. This is what I want you to entertain. Amen? It's very quiet out there. It'll get better, I promise. <laughs> Has my heart cry been smothered by the weight of where my eyes and heart are looking? This was so heavy on me. I won't say heavy, but it was coming so strong during the altar time last week that I literally walked up behind people and laid my hands on them and said, help them find their voice. Help them find their voice. Help them find their voice. Because sometimes situations and things that we entertain, things that we, we know we're not supposed to be even looking there, we know, and I'm not, I'm not even talking about entertainment right now. I'm talking about things of life, situations that we know will bog us down. And we're looking and we're engaging and the Lord's like, ah, I don't want your eyes there. I don't want your heart there. Eyes on me. Well, he's like, please, eyes on me. If you'll just keep your eyes on me, I've got this. We'll do it even when he's telling us, I've got that. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Get your eyes over here. Don't worry about that. It's like when you're crossing the street with your child and they're like trying to walk and they're, like looking back at everything that's going on, it's like, nope, straight ahead. Come on, we got to get across the street. We got to go. We're like that. That's why we're called as children. And he understands. Doesn't mean he approves of it. Our heart cry. When we feel his presence in a way that it demands a response and out of us comes Jesus or oh God you're so good that place in us that can just well up and spring forth and we declare who he is in power and experience because we know who he is because we're walking with him and he's doing things there is a weight that's trying to smother out the voices of his people. And spirit of grace, we need to rise up and declare who he is. And even if it feels strange at first, open your mouth. Let your voice come out until that heart cry is no longer inhibited. Until we can respond to him in a way he loves it, yes, but it does something for our human nature. It sends a signal, not just to our enemy, but to our humanness, our flesh, that we will not sit, stand, dwell in our feelings. Even though society is all, well, how do you feel? Well, if you feel that, then that's okay. Okay. If we reside in our feelings, it will dictate our outcome. We have a will. 
I can't go by what I feel. It will betray me every time. And so that's why several months ago, the Lord kept coming to me. I'm going to walk my people right out of their feelings, and I am going to plant them. He can only do it if we allow him to. I'm going to plant him in the truth, them in the truth of my word and who I am so that when feelings are trying to dictate, we move, nope, God is constant, he is sovereign, he is in control, he holds me well, he is a healer, he is a way maker. I can't see it, but that's who he is. So I choose to step out of my feelings about whatever's going on and plant myself. And sometimes, you guys, I'm not saying this like this is easy. Sometimes it's a moment-by-moment moment thing. No. I refuse those feelings that tell me all is lost. The impossible does not exist with him. All things are possible with him. I have lived, like I said, my entire life in his presence and exposed to him and his body. But there have been times where he said, me alone, right here. You can't go to other people for comfort, right here. There were times of growth in teaching, something I had to know. So when the, and sometimes we want to avoid it because after a little bit of experience with this, you know something's coming. And he, in his wisdom and great love for us, is prepping us. But what we grow to know is that when he's preparing us for something, he's got the whole thing. He's not just saying, okay, be prepared because, you know, when you get there, I'm going to let you go and you're on your own. He's way ahead of us. He's always way ahead of us. It blows my mind all the time. Like, what was I worrying about? You had it. We still have to stay in tune with him. Amen. Am I looking for the living among the dead things? That sermon that Pastor preached was so on time. Am I looking for the living among the dead to the point that I am coasting, wandering? I no longer feel that cry rise up within me because I've brushed it away so many times. When was the last time I felt compelled? This is not condemnation. These are just questions that we have to ask. All of us. Every single one. When was the last time I was compelled to run to an altar and seek him? Or run to my prayer room and seek him? Or pull the car over on the side of the road and seek him? Because I heard him calling. When was the last time? And did I respond? Was my response, catch me later, Lord? I don't have time. It doesn't mean he's going to keep us for an hour. He can do in one minute. He's done it for me in one minute when I've said, I hear you. I'm responding. I'm right here. What are you saying to me? What do you need me to do? Tell me. And he delivers it. He knows your schedule. He knows your responsibility. He, see, he sees all of it. And he's so faithful. He's so faithful to meet us in all of those places. There are times when he speaks, we better move. We better find him. It is for our good that we find him. 
because he's going to give us something that we really need, even if it's correction. What or who is getting in the way? We need to ask ourselves this. Okay, Lord, my eyes have been... I know, I got distracted. Sometimes we just have to look and say, what's getting in the way? Who is taking his place? See, Lord means he's at the center. As pastor says, he's not a spoke in the wheel. He is the center. And when we keep him there, everything else somehow gets ordered like only he can. Am I living a life of obedience or rebellion? And we think of rebellion as this big old nasty word. It is. But we tend to put it in the big things. Like, well, this, I, well, no, I didn't know, well, but that's not rebellion. Rebellion is this. We have to take a look at that. We can become so familiar with the idea of who he is, so casual about our walk with him, that we forget our need of him until we are in crisis. He is not a genie lamp. Jesus, I need you. If our relationship is only active when we are in crisis, then we are missing the most beautiful part of it, where we give him access to all of it. I must have continual and constant exposure to him so I can reflect him and his glory. We will find beauty in desolate places if we are continually seeking him. In some of the hardest places in my life, because I knew this comes with growth. If you listen to him and you follow him, he will prove himself. And he will prove himself in a way that's unforgettable. Usually, it's during those really hard places where we're not exactly happy that he's allowing it. But if we surrender and say, Lord, take the wheel. Just show me where to be. I've shared it many times with my mom. I was looking, I was reacting in my flesh. I was like, Lord, someone is going to come to Jesus really soon, and it's not going to be my mom, and it's not going to be me. Lord, and I was expecting, it's going to be okay. I know. That's not a right response. They shouldn't be doing that. What it was was very stern. I've got a plan. Here's the map. Here's where I need you. Plant your feet there and stay put. This is where I, it wasn't I knew he understood the way I was feeling. I knew he understood me thinking that I needed to respond in a way. I knew he understood that I was, I was losing patience. I was not holding on to grace. I was kind of right there at that tipping point where I was like, Lord, you better intervene. Be a fence. I was being very honest with him. And I thought I needed a big hug. And what I actually needed is a good old-fashioned talking to. He's like, here. 
I've trusted you with a little bit of information. You know where we're going on this. So here's the plan, and here's where I need you on the battlefield. So plant yourself here and do not move. I was like, okay. You know how you do with your kids? You move one more time. Okay. When I stayed where I needed to stay, he began to unveil the beauty. In one of the hardest journeys of my life, I can stand here today and say it was full of beauty and healing and restoration. Is my mom here today? No, she's in glory and I would never call her back. Can I say I'm thankful for the journey? Yes. Do I miss her? Yes. But I can't say that I would rather not have because what he, if we will do this, you guys, if we will put ourselves in his hands and stay aware and stay exposed to him and stay in his light so we can reflect it. It's not in and of ourselves. So if we don't allow ourselves to be exposed, then we'll end up reflecting our own flesh. This is the way I feel, so this is what you're going to know. There is beauty to be found when we align with him even in the really hard places. He comes to us differently there. He comes to us differently. And you learn, I said this before, but it, this is my heart cry. He comes to us and reveals things about himself that we did not know before. That's why we can never get complacent because he is so vast and there is so much to him that we have yet to even know. That when we keep ourselves in line with him, we are exposed to those things and wonder comes. My God, you are amazing. I didn't see that before. I didn't know. You. I mean, I know you can do all things, but I didn't know you could do that in that way. I didn't know that that would be the outcome. I didn't know that you could take something that was so twisted and gnarled and ugly and make it so beautiful. I never could have imagined, imagined that that was the plan. It's who he is and who he wants to be to us so we can never say, this is enough. I'm going to church on Sunday. I love being in his presence with you, but I cannot just rely on Sunday. Your place where you are, and I am watching this. I am watching this in a couple different situations going on in our church, and I'm getting texts one minute that are just like, and then in an hour, after we have joined together in prayer, God is moving, and I get the next text. This is happening. It's so, it's so amazing, and it, like this is a miracle in itself. And to say he's faithful sounds trite. And surprising. If you're bored with Jesus, you're probably needing to ask yourself some of these questions. If you feel complacent, let me help you with a few things that help us stay in a place where we can reflect his glory. And we can honor him in the way he should be honored. Does it mean we're not going to make mistakes? 
touch yourself. I can pull this a little more than I like. Doesn't necessarily bounce right back anymore. It's like, okay, lay down and behave. As long as we're walking here, we're going to mess up. He understands, but he also expects us to do what we know to do. Because that's how we grow. So there are six things. And I have 17 minutes. 18 minutes. I don't know how many minutes. But I'll be done at 10.30, even if I have to talk really fast. How do we stay in a place where we can reflect his glory? Repent. Confess it. I'm not talking about going to a man and confessing. I'm talking about the Savior of the world, the great I am. Have a meeting and say, Lord, I really enjoyed just talking out loud to him. I'll be driving the car and I'm like, it's a one, it's not a one-sided situation, but if you were sitting in the car, you'd probably think I'd lost it a little bit. Because I'll be driving, yep, I know, I know, I didn't do so great on that one. I'm sorry, I know, you did tell me. We talked about this, and I'm trying. Please help me try harder. Please help me to conquer this. I find it very comforting to just say it out loud. Because, also, I want the enemy of my soul to know, I'm not talking to you. You know I messed up, and you've come to condemn me. But I'm talking to him. There's no other conversation happening. I know. I'm acknowledging. Acknowledgement. When we try to ignore the fact that there's something going on that shouldn't be going on, that he's talked to us about something, now I am going to get into entertainment. When God is talking to you about, don't watch that. Let everybody else watch it. But it's not good for you. We need to listen because he loves us big and he knows what's going to get in the way. I'm just going to say it because the Lord brought it to me this week. And Pastor Tim can correct me if I'm out of line and I will accept that correction. But I was watching a blip of a sermon. And the man was preaching. And what I felt coming from it was familiar, where God has given you something on your heart, and you are trying to get it out to his people. Because what is coming from him is so urgent and so important. And you're trying to relay it, and that's what I felt coming from this minister. And he said, you know, he said, we have normalized so much that should not be part of our lives. That we will allow, we will watch things. We will watch people on our TVs and movies and whatever and whatever. I'm not preaching against TV. I'm telling you, when he speaks to you, listen and obey. That's the message. If I need to reiterate that later, please come to me, because I don't want anybody to misunderstand where I am. But he said, we will watch that. We will idolize people. We will take our eyes and, and fix our eyes on things that we would never allow in our home. We would never allow those people to come in our home and behave like that. We would never allow them to come in our home and do, well, it's entertainment. But we would not entertain it in our own home. And why? You answer the why. Because it's not good for us. It's not good for our children. 
and I talked to another individual in my family, and they were like, he's been dealing with me about the same thing. He's coming so strong, folks, that don't get caught up. Well, last year I did, and you didn't say anything, Lord. Last year it was like, last year I didn't need to spend that much time in prayer. Last year I didn't. Where are we standing? 2024. But we expect him to move in today. We expect him to be active in our today and have the answers and the provision for today. But we want to have the relationship and rely on the relationship from the past. It doesn't work that way. He's constantly in his love for us, growing us, because he sees the big picture. He knows what's going to cause you to stumble. He knows what's going to chip away at your resolve and get you to say, What's well, it's okay. It's all right. I didn't feel that much conviction when I watched that. Those are thoughts that should shake us. But we're living in a world where that's what's being spoken. It's okay. You're not hurting anyone. Listen to him when he speaks. Listen to him. Don't look and say, well, so-and-so, they... I never got away with that with my mother. Well, so-and-so does it. She wouldn't go to the, if you're going to jump off the bridge. And I would not, like, advise you to even say that to any young people now because they probably would have an answer for that. Like, well, I, I might have, like, a bungee rope. I'd be fine. Some wise crack like that. Well, you know, depending on the height that you're falling and if it's water, they're very resourceful with their words these days. My mom would say, what's your name? Trisha. What's your full name? Trisha Murray Smalley. So you're my child? Yes. Are they my child? No. All right, then. I love you. (laughs) I love you, too. She was so right. Why do we try it with the Lord? What's your name? Who have I called you to be? What path do I have you on? All right then. I love you. We need to acknowledge our sin and repent of it because acknowledgement opens the door to change, growth, transformation ignorance or ignoring it or making it normal is a roadblock to growth. When we acknowledge it and take care of it, we declare the righteousness of God and that he is the answer. Number two, we forgive others. It is said that we are never more like God than when we forgive. Because when we forgive others, we are proclaiming his compassion and eagerness to forgive. He forgives us, right? How many, like I, I've lost count a very long time ago. When we forgive, we are putting his glory on display. We are reflecting it. I got a little excited because when I was um, studying, I came across one of the one of my favorite. Um, oh, it's right here. Sermons that Pastor has preached when he talked about him being the originator. There are certain sermons when he hits on something and you can feel the power of God literally shake the place. It's like, (laughs) 
And this was one of them. And I just, sometimes it's just kind of hard to stay in my seat because I want to act out. <laughs> I want to spiritually act out. Oh, chapter 6 of Matthew. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth, or as pastor said, in me, let it be done in me as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And up in the top, and this was Jesus' little nudge to me. You're on the right track, hon. Keep going. I reflect what was, what is, and what is to come because I'm reflecting the originator. It matters. It matters. Trust God, number three. If God does all things for our good, and he does, I came across this when I was studying. If he ref does all things for our good, and he does, then demonstrating a trust in him puts his nature and character on display. I trust him, but all this stuff's going on. How do you trust? What do you mean you trust God? Like, look at all that that's going on around you. Look at, like, this is hard. This is like, how are you making it? How are you? I trust him. And suddenly, someone is not looking at the situation. But their eyes are lifted to another place. How can they trust him like that? What do they know about him that they can trust him in such a way? I want to get to know what they know so that I can trust God in that way. It's a witness when we trust him, even though it looks like all is lost. We reflect who he is. Romans 4. Sorry, Elena, I didn't, I missed this one. It's okay, though. Talking about Abraham, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and cause, calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Not staggering, fully persuaded, believing. We declare his glory. Number four, produce fruit, fruit, fruit. Okay, buckle up, because here we go. When his attributes are reflected in our lives, the fruit that is produced and the reflection glorifies God. Say, it's not about me. Glorify him. Reflect him. Keep your eyes on him. We get to reap the benefit of all that but it's always got to be about him. When it's about him, you're going to see him do things that'll blow your mind. 
all about him. If it is a hack version of his attributes, it will not when we're trying to do it in and of ourselves. It's got to be about him. If we touch his glory, we can't touch his glory. So when something happens and it's awesome, our first words need to be glory to God. The work where his attributes show in us is a process. I wish there was like a little thing we could go into and spin around and come out and constantly reflect in. But it's a process. We have to continue to grow. It would be nice if there was like a little laser. Boop. Whoa, glorifying God. Boop. But it's a process. We have to grow and continue to grow to continue to reflect his goodness and his greatness. Five, give thanks. He who offers us, this is Psalms 50, 23. He who, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving glorifies me. And to him, the part in the study that I was looking at only had that part. And I was like, I think it says something else. And it does. It says, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. We are responsible for flipping our conversations in a conversation or somebody's in a conversation and you are present if you say nothing you might as well count on somebody walking away from that conversation and say yeah that's what we thought and so and so was there too I'm sure that's what they thought they did, well they didn't say anything but I'm sure that because they were standing there so I learned a long time ago when stuff starts going south make your exit uh, I need to go God taught me that a long time ago when I would get into situations in my youth and things would start turning from the original plan. Make your exit. Go now. And I learned to listen to him, and it always proved out. We often have much to say when things are going wrong, but are silent when he comes through with the breakthrough. The miracle, the way that was made when there seemed to be no way. Suddenly we are silent. We should not be. We should be declaring even more. Look what God has done. Look what he has done. I know I told you a couple weeks ago, but look what he did. That's reflecting his glory. It's putting his glory on display. It's allowing someone else who is facing something so hard and they just don't think that they could possibly put their faith in God because it just seems too big. Well, let me put his glory on display. This is what he did for me, and he can do it for you. Thanksgiving focuses on the one who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Thanksgiving acknowledges this, that he is the orchestrator of all. And it reflects his glory. Last one, pray. Prayer shines the spotlight on God's attributes. He writes for us to call on him. He demands that we cast our cares upon him. It's not a request. It's bring it. Matthew 5, I think I already read it, 14 through 16. No, I wrote the wrong reference down. Glorifying God is a life that reflects him, his attributes, a lifestyle that is consumed with putting his glory on display. Glory to God. Reflect him. Stay in a position of exposure. Don't let anything get in the way of him. It's never good. And it's a work in progress. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you've given us opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for our kids who are coming.